So, elephants or bird animals, that means they live in groups, they live in families. It's usually about three to five cows, or maybe one or two aged bulls. And they keep in this group for almost ever. And eventually, a baby elephant is born. And first, the baby elephant stays with the group and wanders around the savannas in Africa. I'm talking about African elephants, by the way, not the Asian species. And when the baby elephant grows older and it's a bull, it will be eventually kicked out of the group. And the young, young bulls, they will form a new group and go their own ways for a certain time. And they form like a little family of young elephant bulls. And when they grow older and maybe are a little bit more tempered again, uh, they are eventually allowed back to the herd, to the family. So uh, after some time, a young bull rejoins a herd of elephants and becomes again part of the group. Now, elephants, unfortunately, are an endangered species. And man has to do something to assure survival of elephants. And now step in the zoos. We have the ASA, the Association of Zoos and Aquaria, that uh, actually takes care of breeding uh, endangered species with special breeding programs. And there is a, an elephant breeding program. And that's about what I'm going to talk here a bit. So there are actually standards for elephant management and care. You cannot just have an elephant in your zoo. You have to have trained personnel who knows how to deal with elephants. These, these animals are not just big and heavy, they're also pretty dangerous if you don't know how to handle them. So, uh, certain zoos actually have elephant families and breed them. And uh, now what they try to do with these zoos, in the zoos, is to emulate kind of the nature. So, each zoo that holds elephants in a group plays a certain role of a herd at a certain stage in life, in nature. And so when in nature the young bulls are separated from the herd, they're in the zoos, they're separated from the herd in the zoo as well. And there is one zoo in Europe, in Heidelberg, who plays the role of the young bull herd. So all these zoos together play nature to grow elephants in a, what they hope is a natural environment. And the Basel Zoo, for which I work since almost ever, uh, I asked the veterinarian there, the curator of the elephants, what will be the role of the Basel Zoo in this worldwide elephant breeding program. And he wrote me an email that the idea of the new elephant facilities in Basel, the project Tembia, is to have a breeding herd of elephants, a group of four to five cows, and one to two bulls, and the young animals that are newborn. So Basel tries to be a breeding herd. And so they build now a big new cage for elephants. It's, it's a huge uh, compound where they can hold the elephant herd in a more natural way than they did before. The Basel Zoo is very known for his African elephants. They have, uh, since the 50s of last century, they are breeding elephants in Basel. So this new compound is made for a quite large herd 
and uh, traditionally they, they uh, uh, work with elephants in, in, with a method that's called the contact method where you get in direct contact with the animal, you use sticks to uh, teach it what to do and now they're switching to a contact loss, uh, contactless method where the, the guard doesn't get into direct contact with the animal any, any, anymore. So this is a huge undertaking. It's a large compound where they have to put like tons of concrete to build all these structures to hold the herd. And that the whole project is called Tembia. Tembia is Swahili and it stands for movement or walk. And that's the idea. These elephants should have a natural compound where they can walk around, where they feel like in nature. So that's why we have this project Tembia. And that costs money, of course. <coughs> now, there's certain fundraising going on uh, for this project Tembia. And one uh, funny idea they had they wanted to build a rock, a large rock, where you could become uh, a sponsor of an elephant. So uh, a child would pay five Swiss francs, an adult pays double the money, ten Swiss francs, and becomes a sponsor for ten years for the new elephants. And they wanted to have a rock where you can uh, put in coins, and it has a huge display which shows how many sponsors of elephants do we already have. And they also wanted to, the uh, possibility to uh, sponsor uh, these elephants using a text message. Where they send a text message to a certain number and it will uh, book like five, six francs from your phone account. So they were thinking, how could we possibly do that? And what would be the incentive for a child to put in five Swiss francs? So they made a special exhibition about how elephants are being eradicated uh, in the wild. And to enter this special exposition, you have to put in a coin. So, this is the rock. This looks smaller than it is. It's actually quite huge. The display alone has this size, at this size. And uh, when we put this into place with a um, with a crane, it was so heavy that it almost flipped over. So it's really a, a, a quite a large um, structure. So I'm going to talk about this rock now, and not about elephants anymore. Because, as you can imagine, in this rock is a computer. And so, let's look what's in this rock. We have the display, we have the coin rejectors. Actually, it's funny, those machines that accept coins are actually called coin rejectors. So we have two coin rejectors, and we have the computer inside, and this is connected to the internet because we also have the gateway for the text message. And we have to get out this counter value onto the website of the Basel Zoo, because they want to show on the website the current counter. So now it gets gradually a bit more technical and a bit more newish. So let's look at the big picture of the software in this rock. It's a Unix system that runs there. And on the left hand side in red, you see the various devices, the hardware we have in the rock. That's the big display, that's two coin rejectors. They are all connected to a Lua program that's running there. So we have a display.lua, we have a coins.lua program that talks to the coin rejector. And then we have, uh, below these devices here, we have an Nginx web server with a fast CGI interface to a uh, web display of Lua program. Uh, this will provide the counter value over a web socket to a client that's written in JavaScript. 
And then we have on the same Nginx web server, also using fast TGI, another Lua script, uh, sms.lua, which will accept an SMS and also update the counter. So it's actually uh, four Lua programs of which five instances time, <coughs> one to control the big display, two to control the coin rejectors, then the web uh, display, and the SMS gateway. And all these Lua programs, they use uh, the Postgres client library, Lua PGS12, to connect to a Postgres database. So at the very heart of the application is a highly complex PostgreSQL database that manages all these very complicated things. Actually, I'm going to show you the database in a second. These five <coughs> programs on the machine, they run as separate processes. So each of, each of these five guys has his own process ID, has his own connection to the database. And because coin rejectors are such a weird thing to do, I want to go a little bit into detail. This is a coin rejector here. It has uh, the, the slot for the coin and it has a white knob. It's called the door, which you can push in case something is inside and the coin doesn't go through. Actually, we had only once now the problem that coins wouldn't go through. A spider decided to put the eggs of the young within the channel for the coins. So we had to take this out, find the spider, uh, chase him away, and remount everything. In a zoo, you don't kill a spider. <laughs> you take it out and put it into the bushes. So the protocol to talk to coin rejectors <coughs> is actually called CC talk. Don't ask me what it means. Probably coin coin talk or whatever. And whenever we have to support a new device, and we do a lot of funky devices that we control using Lua, the first thing we do is we write a proper C library. So we think about how we do that in C, and we define a header file, we implement all this in C, this looks hairy, I admit, and it is hairy. So we write a CC talk library in Z. I won't go into the details. Uh, we have functions to open the connection to the coin rejector. We have functions to send data to it, to receive data, to program it, to inhibit certain coins. And now the, the basic uh, model of operation of a coin rejector is you have to pull it. You have to query it several times a second uh, to ask if there is any credits if any coin went through. If you don't do this polling, it will stop accepting coins. Maybe that's why they call them rejectors. So if you don't do anything, a coin that will throw in will just come out again. So you have to do this active polling, and then we will get back a data structure that tells us it was a five Swiss franc coin, it was a two euro coin. We accept euros in this uh, rock as well. We could even program it for Swedish Kronen, it's no problem. So, this is the Lua code. It's an event loop, it's an, an iterator, so uh, basically we say as long as there are credits coming in, that's the polling, see our credits will do one poll of the coin rejector. Then we get back an event code, it was a coin, it was a door open, whatever. We get a slot, into which slot was the coin uh, inserted, because there are also uh, bigger machines with more than one slot. Um, which pass did the coin take? Did it go through into the receptacle for coins, or did it come out again? Or we can have sorters where we have uh, bins for each type of coin. So we get all this information back from these coin rejectors. Uh, what kind of coin went through, where did it go to, and so on. So we basically look, was it a Swiss franc, or was it a euro coin? 
and then we add up the total credit. And once we have either five Swiss francs in the left coin rejector, we increase a counter. And if you have 10 Swiss francs in the right rejector, then we increase the count to two because there was an adult. And we reset the credits to zero. Uh, so increase counter, that's what we do at the heart once a coin went through. So what do we do about the display? In the display, we have to show the current counter. That's easy. And this is just a serial line interface where we have to write some escape sequence and the value of the counter, and it will display this in huge numbers. And we have environmental control. This display is so damn bright. It's made for truck loading stations uh, at night. It really is too bright for the neighborship of the zoo. So to not get complaints, we have time control in it. Uh, at, I think, 7 o'clock in the night, it will not display uh, the counter anymore until the next morning, unless there is a coin going through or someone hitting the door now. That's because sometimes at night uh, in the zoo, you can have a special uh, tour, and if they want to show this, they can turn on the display for a moment. So, how do we handle the SMS gateway? That's actually also almost trivial. So we accept in a fast CGI connection from the web server. Fast CGI is a standard where you have a long running process and a web server and they can talk together over a socket very fast. So it is not like CGI where we start the process, process. The process is already running. Communication is very fast and everything goes very quick. So we accept the call from the web server. We reconnect to the database in case we lost the connection. And then we will just output a content type and some text. And the interesting part is this connection exec function where we say update counter, set count equals count plus one. So we have one more sponsorship. And then we send back uh, over the fast CGI connection the current counter value. So there's not much magic in this. Now, the WebSocket client, where um, you see this in action here, by the way, this is the current number of the counter. And I will prove later that this is live. So when we have to update the counter in a WebSocket, a WebSocket is a special means to communicate from a WebSocket with a JavaScript client running in the browser in a very efficient and fast manner. It's not, it's not a stupid thing like Ajax, Ajax that has been used uh, 100 years ago. It's something really modern and fast. So here we do a, a query on the database. Select count from counter, we get the value. Uh, we create a small uh, table, a small Lua table with uh, a command and the value. And we send da this data over the web circuit as JSON encoded data. Who did not yet write a JSON module? <laughs> OK, you all did. So just pick your favorite JSON module and send out data JSON encoded and it will work. This is actually the code from the real software. It is this small, it is that easy to send out data over a web socket. And now, uh, Pullman's Lua part of the web page counter, this is running in the browser, obviously. There is a function of callback on message. Uh, which will be called by the browser automatically as soon as data arrives on the web socket. So uh, we get as a parameter the event, which is the JSON encoded object that we sent in Lua. Uh, we parse this using the built-in JSON parser. Uh, poor man's Lua has JSON included with all the batteries that it has. Uh, now if the command is update counter, 
everything you have to do is to find our element where we display the count and update it. <coughs> so it's like five lines of Lua, five lines of Pullman's Lua, and you have the whole system set up. So now we have to bring all this together. And we bring all this together using the PostgreSQL database. Um, I, I won't go into details of the Lua to PostgreSQL interface because of uh, time and so. And you can always read about this or ask me about this if you're interested. So, the database that we are using here contains a single table called counter. So, it's really not too complex. And the only table contains only a single value, the count, not more. So we're using a full-blown SQL database just to store a single number. That sounds weird. But then there's a trigger, and that's where the magic of Postgres comes into play. We have a trigger function here after update on counter for each row execute procedure <coughs> counter change. So PostgreSQL has a trigger system where you can have a stored procedure to be executed after an insert, update, or delete on a table. And this trigger function is actually quite small. The, the real code it does is here on this line. Notify counter changed. And this is a PostgreSQL extension. PostgreSQL has asynchronous notifications. Someone who's interested in a certain event can uh, show his interest by issuing a listen command. Listen counter change. And then someone who creates the event can use the SQL command notify counter change. And this signal will immediately be spread out to all listening clients. So it's really a system to notify connected clients about a state change. So you can very easily uh, implement something that Java guys call the observer design pattern using processes and PostgreSQL. The return new, it will just return the new value of the <coughs> record being changed. So, what happens? A client registers for an event using listen and an arbitrary name. Any, any other client can fire an event using notify statement. And at any time, if you're no longer interested in certain events, we just send an unlisten uh, command and we won't get any more events. Now trigger procedures can actually create these notifies. So you can send out a message as soon as some data changes. You can do that on insert, update, delete, truncate. So basically anything that changes the data can be used to trigger a function. Now, the client does an update of the database, the server creates the notification, and the beauty of all this, these five processes that you have seen in the beginning, in the big picture, they're completely decoupled. They don't know shit about each other. If I get a new sponsorship via SMS, the only thing I do is an update on the database. I don't have to care if there's a display process, a back display process, or whatever, or if there are 10 or 1,000 clients looking for this. I just update my table, and that's it. So this gives us a clear design in the code. And that brings us to an important question. Should our code be database agnostic? Do we only use the common features every database gives us? or do we rather go for DB specific? Do we use advanced features of the database? And what we are obviously doing here is the second 
Uh, we use the advanced features of PostgreSQL. Uh, you can't do that with MySQL anyways because it has no advanced features. <laughs> so, uh, let's talk briefly about PG SQL. That's the Postgres interface. I'm really not going into detail here. Uh, the Lua PostgreSQL interface is a DB-specific interface to allow you to use all the advanced features of PostgreSQL from Lua. Uh, there exists a, uh, from Project Lua, a database interface, but it's more DB agnostic. It works with MySQL, it works with PostgreSQL, and probably other SQL implementations. And that's perfectly fine if all you want to do is store data, retrieve data, and so on, then the standard Lua interface is just good. If you want to do something really more with PostgreSQL, like asynchronous notifications or whatever, uh, then you probably want to look into this module. So let's take a brief look into the rock. That's the display there, there's nothing much to see here. But I want to show, maybe I first show you how all this, now that you know how it is glued together, how it actually works, so uh, demo time. Mm -hmm. What you see here on the left is the website of the project Tembia. You see we have 16,582 sponsors right now. I have a separate browser window open there uh, where you see the current count, not on the web, it's also it's the same WebSocket client that you saw in Woman's Lua. And you have here my iPhone, still here? Yes, so I have the same. Now here I'm connected to the console and this connection now goes directly into this box in Basel. It's uh, linked, the cable goes through a little river in the, in the zoo. Also, the, the power uh, cables go through this little river. So we're now really there, and uh, I think that's kind of funny. So select count from counter, uh, as expected, 16,582. And now I'm going to just update the counter by one. <laughs> uh, this is live, so the display, the big display in the Basel Zoo will now change. So. I put a one. Now you see it did in real time change over the WebSocket. It also did it here on the iPhone. It doesn't matter how many clients are connected. I just do an update and it will just work. So now it has to be correct, the counter. I'm, a, I'm officially allowed to do these games. <laughs> And if someone is there looking at the display, yeah. yes. the display goes down. I, I uh, once made a demo uh, just showing how, it, how rapid it can count down. So I did a loop. And now I imagine the guy responsible for the PR <laughs> yeah. standing there. Where's my sponsorship going? <laughs> but then he, he knows me. He knows, ah, it must, it must be Bomber. Can the elephants hmm? see the display? Sorry? Can the elephants see the display? No. <laughs> no. Actually, the elephants, uh, we're talking about Harry, Rosie, Malaika, and Maya, that are our cows. They are now in Basel in a smaller compound where they're building the new one. And Yoga, our bull, is actually in Sweden. I wanted to bring him along, but you know. <laughs> The hotel management, no pets allowed. <laughs> so, go back to the coin rejected program. So, what we do in the increase counter function there uh, that you have seen, uh, we check the database connection, we reconnect the database if it has gone down. If, if I restart the database server for all the connections will be uh, no longer valid, so the programs will always reconnect first, so this is a very, very stable software application. It's now running for more than a year without a single interruption. And so what we do 
here from Lua, update count to set count equals count plus one, what I have done myself. And the reconnect database function actually, it just checks the status of the database if it's bad or okay. If it's bad, then we do a connection reset that will uh, retry the connection with the same credentials. And we again ask for the status. And if it's still bad, we're going to sleep. We just wait for one second. Unix is a separate module that we did for this. So we just basically wait until the database is up again, and then we reconnect. There's nothing more we can do. And now the reconnect database, uh, actually, uh, we are uh, not in the coins program, but in the other programs, uh, in the display program, for example, we are interested in certain events, so it's not enough to just reset the connection. Uh, we also have to send these listen commands again to be notified about state changes of the value. And so the very innermost loop of the disk load program is just an endless loop which consists of process notifies. Has there been a change? And handle these notifications and check the time because we don't want the display to be lit at night. So that makes the, the notification processing in a display program a tiny bit more complicated because uh, here we have this um, the darkness override that you see here. Darkness is two, that means if it's night, then we don't update the display. So processing notifications in Lua is actually super, super easy. Uh, you can take away the reconnection function there. It's actually a loop that we do. We ask for connection notifies. And as long as this is not nil, we can ask for the rel name. That's the, the name <coughs> that we set on the notify command. We can do anything we want. And then we call just connection notifies again. And we do this as long as n is not nil. Now if you say, why didn't you do an iterator properly for this, then yes, why didn't I do that? Because I'm lazy. So now opening the door also turns on the display. Right? So if the rel name, the name of the event is door open, then we override the darkness. And uh, we do for like five or 10 minutes, the display will be lit. If you're interested in the Lua Postgres interface, if you use Lua and Postgres, then you are interested in the Lua Postgres interface. Um, you can find it on GitHub. It's open source. It's well pro proven in, uh, in production environments. Uh, roughly uh, 15 to 20 percent of all museum entries in Switzerland are handled using this code. And so it has proven its stability and its functionality. So grab it if you want. Contact me if you have questions or if you want to see if PostgreSQL and Lua is the right thing for you. Uh, we can talk. And if you want to reach me, that's my contact information. Yes, and that's basically it about African elephants, PostgreSQL and Lua. And the last thing, in case you don't know, the PostgreSQL logo is actually an elephant. <laughs> <laughs> now you're free. <laughs> hey, Mark, what's with the lack of error checking? Lack of error checking, okay. Um, nine months ago. <laughs> <laughs> No, I was going to say, like, you do like the con exec, which um, you get the result back, and you have to check with the results of type error, um, but you didn't. Uh, actually, I, we did all of the stuff, so we know what can happen and what not. <laughs> so. You mean error checking in the library, or error checking the program? No, no, like, uh, in your increment, increment counter function, um, the, that can actually fail, that's the exec call. Yes. So. It could fail. <laughs> <laughs>
Right. Yeah, but look, we're also doing support. <laughs> <laughs> if, it's, if it's perfect when you sell it, I mean, that's the point. <laughs> yes. Uh, did you write your own web server to uh, or did you use something that's available and what, what about the test CTI in, in this project, we use Nginx. And uh, the fast CGI library that's been around for ages. And we made a fast CGI binding for Lua so that we can talk fast CGI over Lua. So it's standard product here. We started with a light HTTPD, the light um, But that one has bugs when it comes to fast CGI. So uh, we had to stop using it. Do you have that uh, library for Coinbase published? No. You, you showed the logo. I showed what? The logo for the library. I went to yes. To Google it, the logo is probably in terms Yes. I mean, I mean, who needs coin rejectors in the real world? So. <laughs> I, I, I use them twice now. I mean, uh, Basel Zoo calls me, hey, can you, can you build us this machine? Because nobody on earth builds such machines. And we were crazy enough to say yes. And uh, it was actually quite a piece of fun uh, to find out all about this CC talk. And uh, I, I don't think that anyone besides us does coin rejectors and Lua, so. I know it. Ping me if you need it, but I have no plans to publishing that. Actually, I pulled a lot of my libraries from GitHub recently because it uh, makes no sense to publish stuff that nobody uses, and there's enough JSON libraries out there anyway. Okay, thank you very much. And